Thank you. Yeah, well, I wasn't quite sure how what I have to say will be received, so we'll find out in a few minutes. Um, actually, by way of uh, introducing this topic, uh, it's interesting. Back then, I came to his Lee's conference, which at the time was about telecommunications. And I remember sitting through a series of these fascinating talks about essentially advances in radio, advances in the overall infrastructure, and, and thinking, oh my god, I'm out of place here. Yet, incredibly fascinating stuff. And here, again, I'm listening to some really amazing um, discussions of sensors beneath the body, uh, new clinical methods, and so forth, and again, feeling both out of uh, sorts, why am I here? But as a designer, I realized maybe my goal is to try and hint at a little bit of the now what question. When these things become common, just like with the question of the cell phone, when it becomes so obvious that these things are going to happen, what happens to us? Because as a designer, um, I've been doing this uh, for 20 years now, I have a little design firm called Argo Design, but uh, more importantly, for 20 years, I ran the creative organization of Frog Design, and in that saw a lot of these questions emerge and realized that my goal, my role in that is really to try and help figure out, so what's that mean for people? And today, I see this still. As much as that topic has advanced, and I don't know why that's blinking, um, we still look at these like tools. And what happened? Yeah, OK. But um, these tools have advanced to the point where they're not really simply just tools. They are deeply, intimately part of our life, so much to the point that they really define us sometimes in negative ways. We are still trying to figure out what they mean. And even more so, we're not sure whether they are, in fact, tools or real extensions of us. And again, um, I lost my slides. OK, yeah. Uh, now, I'm going to show you a few things. You're going to go, where is he going with this? And trust me, I'm going to get to an interesting place. The first is all of the things we associate with around us, the ordinary objects, they have become so capable from the same types of technology that we're talking about in terms of our body that they cease to become simply just tools. They sometimes become, or quite often now, become much more than that. Turn the volume up. Uh, I always really liked chemistry and physics in school. The study of physics is incredible. Take gravity. You can't see it, but the second okay. you trip, it's right there. So down. he's essentially talking to what was a simple toy. So if you still are not sure about what's happening to the world around us, the physical objects around us, I hope this convinces you. Likely, similar objects, ha thing, a similar phenomena is happening to the spaces around us. This is in Central Park earlier this year, this summer, with uh, the Pokemon There's phenomena, right with so the, the game running. that everyone was playing <laughs> in finding Pokemon. Essentially, a very valuable one had occurred in the virtual space that was Central Park, and the world went nuts. All right, so if that's happening to all the things and the places, right, because of this sort of computerization of everything, then it raises the question of what's happening to us. And this is where I'm probably most fascinated. It's, it's a pretty obvious thing to design things nowadays. Um, but the design of us has become a truly next generation challenge to try and figure out. And so trying to decode that myself, I think about this sort of immutable notion of the real me and this emergent truth of the digital me. The fact is, this me has become so incredibly prolific that for a lot of the way people see the world, they see this, and they get to know this. And I, I even talked about that at the last e-commerce con conference many, many years ago. And when it was an emerging idea then, 
uh, and it's now become a very concrete reality. So what, what's interesting is today, uh, the density of that has become so incredibly convincing that it, for example, with Facebook, just the sheer data they contain, one company contains about me, that it raises the question of, is that just simply uh, data about me, or is this maybe something we need to look at differently? When I look at the way people act and the way they think of themselves, just like the way I think of myself as not independent of the choice in fashion, the choice in the way I behave, but as a composite, the digital me and the analog me is now the composite me, right? I am inseparable from that new reality. So when I think about my well-being, when I think about not just the literal tracking of my well-being and you know, what, what my watch tells me is going on, I am this data. I am the digital version of me. And the two of those are constantly being challenged, the balance of that. And of course, we struggle to mediate the difference between those two. I can be, all right, a digital person and an analog person. Now I want to add to it a new phenomena. Artificial intelligence, one of my customers, a company called Cognitive Scale, thinks of this emerging, this emerging technology as being able to answer any question on any subject from anywhere. Now I come back and I apply that to myself. And that idea immediately starts to challenge the idea of when am I myself and when could I perhaps extend myself and behave in this world, maybe through that digital me. I'm more than just my data. I'm now a learned thing, an artificial thing, that can now interact with other people, can make appointments. It can make judgments. Uh, in my stead. It can have conversations in my stead. If, you're not sh if you don't believe that, if you don't believe how literal that can quickly become, think about this. Google just released a tool recently, Allo, that takes simple conversations and suggests what I might say. So it's learning from me and starting to speak on my behalf. I'm sure you guys have run into this case. We're LinkedIn suggests happy birthday, right? This to me is this emerging notion of a sort of a Cyrano de Bergerac, a character that stands under while Christian tries to talk to Roxanne. And Christian, of course, is, doesn't quite have the words. Well, Cyrano provides the words. To me, this digital me now has the words. It has the ideas. It has the information about me. Um, that helps me become something much more. But I don't think of that as a cheat. I think of that as just simply me. I mean, when LinkedIn does that, I don't think of it as a cheat. That is an extension of me. That suggests to me an emerging notion of cognitive dependence. Have you guys noticed that you find yourself driving around and don't really realize that you're not sure where you are because you're simply following the maps? That kind of cognitive dependence, imagine every aspect of your life extending to that phenomena. Imagine every kind of decision that you could possibly make in life being enabled by your digital self. What does that do to you? You find yourself in funny situations that you're not wholly responsible for. We also become nodes in this overall network. So the sense of ourselves as an immutable, separate thing from this digital landscape should be challenged. This is a project worked on while at Frog Design. It's the Disney World Magic Band. And this Magic Band essentially allows people in that park to connect with the park so that the park essentially knows where they are. They know where everyone is and what they're doing. And in that, they can create these magical moments. So for example, the little kid walks up to 
Buzz Lightyear, and Buzz knows it's his birthday. And Buzz can say happy birthday and can say happy birthday, Timmy. A magical moment. It's a moment enabled by the fact that this kid is essentially, and everyone else in the park, is essentially a node in that network. In other words, that immutable self is really not, it's a digital self, it's a meta self that is now part of that park. So when we think about these measuring systems, when we think about those reading to today our blood levels, tomorrow everything about us, psychologically knowing everything about how we think, we need to think about these phenomena and how simple these are today and what happens with them when more of that data is present. I imagine some good things out of it, augmenting our decisions. Every decision I can make can be augmented, can be pre-calculated. I can look ahead and sample immense possible futures before I make a decision. I can also maybe know some dark truths about myself. How much do I have left? And if I make this decision today, how much will I change that? If I eat that, I'll go here. This level of measurement goes to these ends. I also believe we talk so much about the physical self as if it's sort of a fixed deal, that we simply just measure it passively, and then we create some truths that you then cognitively have to act on. We've been able to play with, um, in our time at Argo Design, uh, some basic ideas of using that same richness of data to actually extend what it means to physically move and act in space. Extensions to your muscles, augmenting how we move. Overall, I, I want to leave you with this idea that every part of our identity that can be supported by computing will be. And because of that, this idea of our digital self is and will be at the very core of how we see and act and therefore at our, with our well-being. Thank you. Hey, Mark. We seem to be missing not the next speaker, but the speaker after. Uh -oh. Therefore, we have some additional time for Q&A. So if uh, Martin has a microphone here, does anybody have any questions for Mark here? There's, there's a hand over. I'm totally with you on the reckoning, so to speak, between your, your digital self and then your quote unquote, uh, I guess, embodied self. And that to some extent you have to really ask yourself the question, to what extent do I like these numbers? Do I think it, do I want them to be the way they are? In terms of wearables in the future, posing that question is often very hard to I guess, create the time and space. How do you basically get a person to stand still long enough and to kind of linger in that ambiguity of that question rather than say, oh, wait, I have a deadline in a week or something like that. Do you understand? Yes, uh, it's a kind of a vague question, but I'll, I'll try and run with it. I think we've been embracing um, behaving as digital selves rapidly today. So things, think about Facebook. You, could, you might say that the last election, that just happened last week, was largely driven by our new digital reality as opposed to you, I mean, the argument is today Facebook drove that, um, or at least had a, a lot to do with it. So the idea that all of that data that, chose, that drove people to decide in an analog way um, th through that digital data, I'd say if you add a lot of the wearables, you end up in the same kind of scenario, except much more intimate um, set of ramifications. Um, if we're able to measure ourselves, Actually, tomorrow, Ashwin, better answer this, Ashwin uh, from Seno is going to talk. He's a customer of mine. Um, Ashwin has a product. Maybe a few other companies here have a, have a similar type of product technology that is measuring and reporting on your body all day long. And from that, the very moment I eat something, I see the ramifications of that. Uh, 
if that doesn't change your behavior, I don't know what else will. <laughs> did, I mean, I, I think I got the gist of your question. Maybe I didn't. It's, the, the election is sort of a, it's a byproduct of a societal event, so to speak. Uh, I think there's a lot of curation that might happen in the case of like the hamburger, for example. Someone mm -hmm. owes that thing. There's a lot of additional curation that occurs that the human being who has all of these wearables may not actually be a part of. And this, they don't actually think about designing which are the wearables, which are the data streams that I'm actually looking for. What are the questions that I even that I should be battling with? Like, it's very easy if, let's say, um, I don't know. There's a one sort, one kind of a data stream might come from my social sphere. So if I want to engage more with friends, that's going to bump my health in this way. Versus uh, one that's like a biological sphere, engaging uh, like how am I supposed to eat at a particular party? Those might be giving me different sort of indicators. How do I reckon between those things and optimize across those things? And I think it's. Um, there's a, um, sorry if it's not very clear right now, but there's a, a lot of meta, I guess, choosing between the data streams in the design that's not yes, necessarily yes, yes. very transparent initially. Well, the market was supposed to sort that out, wasn't it, uh, in the case of news, and the market's doing a really shitty job uh, sorting that out. So hopefully the market won't have to sort out um, data that drives our life and death uh, of our bodies. Um, I hope this room can sort that out better than that. Uh, I don't have an answer to that question, though, unfortunately. As, yeah. We, we, we have three more questions. And since the speaker has not shown up, we have time for it. So if we begin here. This is a great talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question. We're talking about uh, the physical me and the digital me. Uh, the difference is the, the biological me is very hard to change. That is, you have, you're, you, know, you're, you have genetics, you have so on, but essentially it's very difficult to change. Whereas the digital me is very easy to change. And so in your idea of hyper well-being, is the health of the digital me important? Because that health can be changed. So I can see a future where you create your own health, basically your own definition of health. Or is that something that all of us have to live by the same truth that is... You know, or is there a way to... I think you look at it maybe as a feedback loop. If the physical me can report on all of these things, it drives this emergent, um, much higher fidelity digital me, which today we see just really driven by financial data, by where I walk and who I associate with. If we can add the physiological side of that, then that drives this much more high fidelity version, and that in turn drives who I am and how I behave. Um, the other part of it, though, that uh, not necessarily directly associated is I'm suggesting that that digital me becomes, in the way that the rest of the world sees us, uh, much more important. I mean, you think about you can get denied a job or get a job um, because of the qualifications evident on the digital side before they've even met you. Or even if they met you and loved you, turn, you, know, you can get the dark side of the digital me that shuts that down. We see our lives being driven and conducted on this digital side. So this data that this room is uh, eagerly talking about becomes part of that. And to me, the question is, how does that drive not only my immediate behavior, my ability to make decisions on should I eat that hamburger, but also what does that do to my digital me that is increasingly out there making decisions on my stead, which is to me that, that LinkedIn or that Allo example, but take it much, much further, that ability for it to conduct a meeting or to go out and get a job for me. Hey, I got you a better job. You want to do that? I mean, physically, I have to follow suit. There is something immutable left, but much, much less so than the way we think about it today. I don't have all the answers there, but I'm wanting to suggest that the two march forward inseparably. And today, we still think of it as a toolbox, a tool set. And that's a problem. So Mark, uh, the missing speaker has shown up. And it's not Super. our next speaker. It's the speaker after who was missing. And the speaker after the next speaker. Um, so 
there was two more questions here, but we're going to need to move on. It's Great. a shame, but hopefully you're going to hang around. Thank, Thank you, you very much once again. Thanks, guys.